Okay, we're going to jump around a bunch this morning in Malachi. We'll start in Malachi 1.1. 1, 1. This is the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you have asked, how have you loved us? A son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. But you ask, how have we despised your name? Jump into Malachi 2. And now this decree is for you, O priest. If you do not listen, and if you do not take, to, take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse among you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already begun to curse them, because you are not taking it to heart. I have weird, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you ask, How have we wearied him? By saying, All who do evil are good in the sight of the Lord, and in them he delights. Or, Where is the God of justice? Jumping to Malachi 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Because I, the Lord, do not change, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Yet from the days of your fathers you have turned away from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you ask, how do we rob you? At, those, at that time, those who feared the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a scroll of remembrance was written before him regarding those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day when I prepare my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. In Malachi 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. bow your heads with me we'll start in prayer father in heaven we thank you for the beautiful spring weather lord we thank you for the renewal of life that we see in nature lord we thank you so much that your son paid the price for our sins and died and rose again we know that because he lives we can have full assurance that we will rise again to meet you forever father and we just thank you and praise you that jesus christ did give up heaven lived in a humble and obedient life powered by the spirit and that his sacrifice upon the cross was pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord. Help us by the power of the Spirit to study your word, to be transformed, Lord, to live a life as your child. We thank you and praise you, Lord. Open our eyes to hear what the word has to say to us and apply it to our lives. And we thank you this day for the gift of mothers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget to remind me to tell the ladies that just left, too. If you are a mother only... Come get you a bag over here and a flower. If you are a mother and a grandmother, come over here and get you a bag and a flower, okay? And we'll probably have some left that we might can take the restorium or you might can take with you. I'm not sure, but we'll look at that when it's done. So because he lives, if you think about that song, God sent his son to die for our sins. And we left off with a woman whose son died and the whole town was grieving. And Jesus just had compassion for her. She never asked anything. Jesus just saw her in her state of misery and had compassion and did something about it. He told her first not to weep, and then he went to the, the dead child and told him to rise up, and then he handed him back to his mother. 
She didn't know yet that Jesus would die for her sins. She didn't know that he would rise again. But because he lives, the, the stanzas of, those, of that song, God sent his son that paid the price. And then if you're a mother, you can think how sweet it is to hold that newborn baby. You didn't do any of that. That's a miracle from God, blessing and a heritage. And you walk equally with your husband through this world to be his helpmate, to raise up your children. There is no greater responsibility than to raise up godly children. Remember that. and Remember your position that God has given you, the honor that he's given you. And then one day, we'll cross that river. We'll fight life's final war with pain. Because death will come. If you remember the centurion asked that his servant be healed from death, and that happened. But then Je Jesus showed through Luke's works that he had power over death. But like I said, who would know that he would go on to die for our sins and pay the price so that we could not only have physical life, but eternal life. So if you want to turn to Luke 7, I'm going to read this passage, and then I'll start talking about why we read from Malachi first. It'll make more sense when I read this. And I want to start in Luke 7, verse 16. Your, if your Bible is divided, it probably has 16 in the previous verses, but it goes just as well with the next verses because this is why John asked his question. And then we're going to concentrate on what is the question. Verse 16, A sense of awe swept over all of them, and they glorified God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has visited his people. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding region. So Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing his orderly account, is telling you that news about Jesus went everywhere. Everybody was talking about Jesus now because he raised someone from the dead. Verse 18, Then John's disciples informed him about all these things. They informed John. So John called two of his disciples and sent them to ask the Lord, Are you the one who has to come? Has, has, was to come, or should we look for someone else? When the man came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we look for someone else? At that very hour, Jesus healed many people of their diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. You might have caught some of that from Mark's reading in Malachi. After John's messengers had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? Otherwise, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Look, those who wear elegant clothing and live in luxury are found in palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will repair your way before you. Maybe you're seeing why we read Malachi a little bit. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no, no one greater than John, yet even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people who heard this, even tax collectors, acknowledged God's justice, for they had received the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for them, because they had not been baptized by John. To what then can I compare this, the men of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine, and you say, He's a he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, Look at this glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Now this may not seem like an ordinary Mother's Day sermon, but boy, the Scripture is right on where we need to be. Do you fear the Lord your God? Have you listened to His words and the power of the Spirit trans transforming you to make your path straight? Because the path is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And are you living that so that your children and their children and their children will follow in the ways of the Lord? So what is the question that's asked here? 
And when you study God's Word, and I hope you're reading and studying and doing your devotions and, and spending time with one another, knowing the spiritual gifts that you've been giving and practicing, putting those into practice, knowing that your mission here on earth as a child of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, is to be a witness, a testimony of Jesus Christ. Not only in your words, but in your actions. There is no greater thing that you can do in this world than to show people the way and train them up to be disciples of Jesus Christ, especially your children. So you might have been wondering why we read the scriptures from Malachi, because that's who Jesus quotes here. You need to know that and know that they knew the Old Testament scripture and these words would have been familiar to them. And it had been 400 years since God spoke through a prophet. But if you remember in the beginning of Luke, we have angels that come to speak even. And Zechariah said, how can this be in a, in a negative way? And Mary said, how can this be? Well, that's okay. I tr trust you. What kind of faith do you have? The silence had been broken. The Son of God was born, and He is now doing His public ministry, professing who He is. Remember, prior to that, babies were killed and Jesus had to flee to Egypt because they didn't know the identity of the one who was to come. But that voice crying out in the wilderness is what they went to see because the voice crying out in the wilderness said, the one has come. So we came out to see him. And if, if it pricked our heart, we were repentative and we turned from our ways. Even tax collectors and sinners did that. And we produced fruit that showed that we had truly repented. But so many of the religious said, oh, no, I'm fine because I'm a child of Abraham. Well, <laughs> the rocks can cry out to God. How do you in your life cry out to God and have you repented of your ways? Because it doesn't matter that you go to church every day or it doesn't matter the good works that you do. It matters that you have repented, you have realized that you are a sinner, you have asked God by His grace to save you, and therefore you are a child of God. Now study His Word so you can rightly handle the Word of truth and live it out in your lives. As you read this section, you'll tend to focus on other things other than what was a question. You'll tend to focus on why did John ask this question. That's not as important in this passage. And most of your commentaries will focus on that. Why did John ask these questions? Well, he'd been in prison for two years now because he spoke out against the truth, against the leader of the, the area. And... He was in prison as a result. And you know what happens as you continue to read the story. His head was literally handed on a platter. Wow. Does this sound like what the question is or the, the call is for God's messenger? Well, if you remember, he has already cried out in the wilderness and announced, we don't know what the next steps are. You don't even know what your steps are until the Holy Spirit's leading you. So take those steps. Don't deny the Holy Spirit in your life. And will you know what the next steps are after you take that? No. That's why it's called a walk by faith. It's not by sight. We don't have all the right answers. But you step out of the boat and you let Jesus lead you to wherever it takes you. And I don't think John was sitting in prison saying, poor, poor, pitiful me. I think, I think, this is, I think again, that he was more like Paul and said, I can do all things through Christ that's given me strength. And maybe that question that he was asking was for his disciples. Or maybe that question was, was for the crowds that Jesus responds to. But I don't think John was just sitting in prison going, why me? Because if you remember scripture back from Luke 1, he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. He was the one who would be the voice crying out in the wilderness. He saw the Spirit of God descending on Jesus and he heard from heaven God say, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I don't think a little bit of trouble in his life being in prison is going to make him lose his faith, so to speak. So I'm going to approach this from a little different aspect. Malachi prophesied. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Oh, was he? Or was John the Baptist the last of the Old Testament prophets? Because John heralds the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's important when we talk about the greatest here in a little bit. It was 400 years that there had been silence from God. And then there was the voice crying out in the wilderness. Isaiah 43 through 5 says, Prepare the way for the Lord. That is what John the Baptist 
mission was. To pray, prepare the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make, straight, make a straight highway for your God in the desert. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rugged land a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all humanity together will see it. This was what was going on in the countryside around Galilee. We knew that a great prophet at least was among us. And there were people by the groves bringing them to Jesus to hear him if they would repent or not, but at the least have their things taken care of. And Jesus was doing that. But remember, what is greater for Jesus to heal a lame man or to offer forgiveness for your sins? John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament or Old Covenant prophets preaching a message of the New Covenant that Jesus Christ would die, that His blood would atone your sins, and that he would rise again so that you would have hope of eternal life. Did John know all these things? Go back and study any prophet. He didn't know all the things except what God revealed him to tell. And they went through a lot of heartache because they chose to be faithful to God. They did not have it easy. So being in prison, I'd be like, hey, I've had it easier than, than a lot of the prophets. He was both prophesied about and he prophesied. Whoa, I can't say that about anybody else. But I could say what Jesus said. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Those concerning, those that pointed to the New Testament, that pointed to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So John had the privilege of being prophesied about and to prophesy about the New Covenant. Do you believe? Most everything, like I said, that you read talks about why John said this in a poor, poor, pitiful way. But don't look at that. Skip past that because do, you, do we know why John asked what he asked? Do we know his mood or anything? No, we don't. We just know the question that he asked. It might have been totally inspired by, by the Holy Spirit. His question was, are you the one to come or should we look at someone else? Now, when you look at the question, don't you want an answer? <laughs> the answer is, I am the one. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and turn back to God. Believe and you will be saved. This is the point of this message here. And Jesus even brings in children to tell us what we act like. And as mothers, you can understand that, that, that joy of that newborn baby. But guess what? Then they start growing up, don't they? And that joy is mixed in with a lot of heartache and a lot of anger and, and a lot of other emotions. But your mission is still the same. To raise up that child in reverent and holy fear by the way that you speak, but more by the way that you live because your actions speak louder than your words. So don't give up on that child and pray for that child and live a life that will bring glory and God, honor to God and hopefully that child will see. So you have to put in here, what is your answer to this question? Will you follow me? Are you still living by the law or by whatever it is? If you will follow me, then you will live as a child of God. Now we look back to the Sermon on the Plain and how crazy that life looks in comparison to the world. So I have to ask myself again, am I living counterculturally to the world? Or do I look like the world? Do I look like Christ in this world? Or do I look more like the world? Fast forward to Luke's, in Luke's gospel, and just before his triumphant entry, he talks to a wee little tax collector, remember? And he tells him to repent, tells him to come out of that tree. You can't just sit there and watch. You've got to come out and follow me, because today is the day of salvation, the day that Jesus Christ is reaching out to you and saying, Will you come and follow me? Will you leave the world behind and follow me? Will you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me? Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. If you had a key verse for Luke, that's probably the, where Luke is heading. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 
the least of these, the wretched, the poor, the blind, the elite, the religious. But the problem is it's harder for a rich man and it's so easy to get stuck in our self-righteousness that we tend not to see the truth, the way, the only way to the Father, the only truth, the only way to have eternal life and to teach that to our children and grandchildren and that's Jesus Christ. For 400 years, God has not spoken, but God is faithful. He has not forgotten. He doesn't have another love. It's you, you, you. And that's why God gave His only Son to die for you. In Luke chapter 1, verse 13 to 17, we read this. This is where Gabriel, a messenger from heaven, comes to Zechariah. Oh, let me remind you what the name Zechariah means. Remembered by Jehovah. Because for 400 years there was silence, but while Zechariah was praying in the temple, here came an angel, a messenger, telling him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He, he shall never take wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. I'm going to put in a little parentheses here. And he probably won't whine and cry from prison. I just threw that in. Don't take me wrong. Many of the sons of Israel, he will turn back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the land in the spirit and in power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But Zechariah's answer was, how can I be sure of this? I don't see that that was ever John's answer to anything or his question, especially when his disciples came to him and he said, I must decrease so that Jesus must increase. I must become less so he can become more. I don't see a weak John the Baptist, and I don't see it in Jesus' description of him. I, you, sure, you can wonder. Maybe, hey, what's up next? Maybe the Holy Spirit revealed his death to him. I don't know. What I do know is this. John was training up disciples. Even though he had been in prison for two years, disciples were coming to him rather than Jesus. That wasn't conflict because Jesus said in Scripture, don't worry about them baptizing uh, people. You worry about yourselves and the mission that I have given you. Because John is with us. He's not against us. And I think maybe with his death approaching and the influence of the Holy Spirit, maybe he was telling his disciples, hey, it's time for you to go seek out Jesus and see if he's the one because I won't be here much longer. And you're supposed to be following him anyway. Just my thoughts. But Zechariah said, how can I be sure of this? And you know what happened as a result? He was silent until this child was born. Much like the silence that came before Gabriel. Now, Zechariah is silent till he sees the birth of his child, John, the one that would be firm, strong in the wilderness, a man's man who would eat locusts and honey and survive. And you went out to see a prophet because you know this was a prophet of God. And he said to turn and repent and to produce fruit showing that you repented. And everybody came to see him in the wilderness, but not everybody repented, did they? But tax collectors and sinners did. Now look how Gabriel described John the Baptist and think how Jesus describes him later here. Great in the sight of the Lord, he shall never take wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. I don't see that lacking in any way. He was a strong man, a divine prophet, filled with the Holy Spirit to where he met Jesus in the womb and he leaped for joy. I don't think he really doubted. If I ask you, hey, is this today that we're going to go fishing? I don't doubt that we're going fishing today. I'm just clarifying, are we going fishing today? His message, verse 17, He will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, which Jesus refers to, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the, to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That is what John the Baptist's mission was. That is what he did. He knew that Jesus was the one. So sometimes when you have that question asked, it's for your own benefit rather than the person asking that question, isn't it? Luke, 
was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. He came to faith because of other people's faith. And he gave up this world so that he could follow Jesus. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? To train up others so they will follow when our life is over. That's the only way that we're, our heritage and legacy will live on. Is if we live like Jesus. Because we follow Jesus. And therefore others will do the same. Remember what Je Jesus said to John when... I mean, to Thomas, when he doubted, we, turned it, we tried to label Thomas as a doubter, but we don't know that that's true. We just know he said, I want proof. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Your purpose is to live out the gospel message, especially as mothers and grandmothers. If you go back and kind of review over Luke again, Luke chapters 1 through 3 are Jesus' pre-ministry after silence again in the land for 400 years. Then once Jesus' identity is revealed, he is immediately taken into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit to be tested by Satan, who used Scripture twistingly to try to tempt Jesus to disobey, used Scripture to do it. But Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. And he went on and said, I must proclaim the good news. This is Jesus' message and that he would bring sight to the blind. This is exactly what Jesus was doing. And I think John realized that. God spoke through the prophets, through the angels, and now he is speaking through his son. People went into the wilderness and the masses to hear John the Baptist. Luke chapter 3, we read these words. Then John said to the crowds, Then John said to the crowds, coming out to be baptized him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit then in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lies ready at the, at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Are you seeing Luke's or John's word as we have read through Luke and got to chapter 7? The crowds asked him, What then shall we do? John replied, Whoever has two tunics should share with him and who, who has none, and whoever has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came. We read about Levi. To be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what, what should we do? And we know what Matthew's response was. He left his tax collector's booth, never looked back through a party for the rest of his sinful friends. Collect no more, more money than you are authorized, he answered. Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? And we have the example of the Roman centurion that had audacious faith, a faith that was unheard of at that time. But he said, Jesus, just say the word. Jesus, uh, John says here, do not take uh, money by force or false accusations. He gave money to help build the temple. He said, be con content with your rages. The people were waiting expectantly. I remind you for 400 years again. They were all wondering in their hearts if John could be the Christ. Makes a little more sense on his question again. From the person that still people think might be the Christ or he's the greatest prophet or Elijah reborn, that the question comes from him. Are you the one or should we expect another? So that Jesus can answer that question to the crowds. <laughs> no, I am the one. There is no other. Will you accept and believe or not? And if so, will you live a life that, pr that produces fruit showing repentance? Because every good tree bears good fruit. And bad trees will be cut down and burnt. John answered them all, verse 16, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. With these and many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. But when he rebuked Herod the Tetrarch regarding his brother's wife Herodias and all the evils he had done, Herod added, to, added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Where well, let me remind you again, he had free access to his disciples, but now the day was coming when his head would literally be lost for his faith. So it makes sense that this question would come, not in a worrying way, but in, let's just make this statement clear. 
We don't want other people to doubt why I'm in prison. Are you the Messiah? Yes, Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. I don't think John doubted who Jesus was. I think he asked the question for our benefit. <clears throat> Luke continues through his gospel after chapter 3, and we see constant conflict and constant proof that Jesus is the Messiah. We see constantly people choosing to follow and to have faith and doing something about it, and we see people that lack faith, and we see the religious countering Jesus. We see the conflict growing, growing there, up to the point where Jesus gives that sermon on the plain, where Jesus commands you to forgive so that you can be forgiven, to not judge and not be judged. To con not to condemn and not be condemned. To give abundantly, shaken down and stirred together and it'll be put back into your lap. To do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. To be merciful as your heavenly Father will be merciful. What kind of faith do you have? Do you have faith that you know that Jesus has power over death? Because He does. And He does care. That's why He's on His way to the cross. So for about two years, John the Baptist has taught in prison to his disciples, teaching them that Jesus is the way. And now in this scripture, we learn that Jesus is the only way. From the last of the Old Testament prophets, the greatest of those, where his question gets answered by Jesus himself, that Jesus is the only way. We don't know what John was thinking, anything else. But we know what his question was, and we know what Jesus' answer was. <clears throat> Maybe John was doubting some. I mean, we all get there. But usually that leads us, hopefully that leads us, to having more faith, to not doubting him, trust anymore, to rely on daily bread. After Jesus had sent out the twelve, he told them, remember, that they were sheep among wolves and that the gospel message that he was preaching was not to bring peace, but to divide. In Matthew 10, verse 37 to 39, we read, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Then in the next chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, after these instructions to the disciples, he went forth to preach in the cities, and you read this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Meanwhile, John heard in prison about the works of Christ. Even if you were sitting in prison, even if you were down, and you heard about the works of Christ, and you knew Scripture at all, and the Holy Spirit had filled you at some point, let alone from your mother's womb, you would know that these works of Christ were what were revealed about in the Old Testament. Think about the people, the two on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus opened their eyes and pointed that all Scripture pointed to Him. John would know these things unless there was some type of spiritual darkness that had overcome him. He would know the works of Christ, which is why the disciples went to him and told him this. And he sent back, go ask him. John was a man of faith, a strong man. He was sent his disciples, verse 3, to ask him, Are you the one who has come, or should we look for someone else? I don't see doubt in that. I see, if anything, hey, you're worried about who I am and where I'm at in my position, and you've, you've listened to my teachings and stuff. Now, let me point you to the one again that I am pointing you to. I'd, I'll probably butcher this, but I remember a devotional one time where it talked about the is it the Washington Monument that's a big tall one or whichever monument that is? You would never see that monument if it wasn't for the millions, whatever the number of lights are that point their, their light towards that. They are shining. Yes, they're doing that, but they're pointing so that you can see that monument. And that's what our lives are, especially together, that we, our lives live such good lives that it points to our Father in heaven, our good deeds, that we glorify Him. Jesus' reply in Matthew chapter 11, go back and report to John what you hear and see. 
what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blesses the one who don't fall away on account of me. Those words are more for John's disciple because he will be beheaded soon. And they're going to be wondering. But now John has said, go ask Jesus. Go ask this question. Get the answer for yourself. So that when I'm gone, you don't doubt that he is the one that I've been talking about. Jesus is referencing words from Isaiah 35 and 61, chapter 61. So I'll read you the words from Isaiah 35 first in verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for all of those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about it. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Uh, chapter 61, verse 1. He has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are people, people the Lord has blessed. Jesus' answer to John's disciples for the question that John posed for them to ask was, don't you see the works that I'm doing? You can't doubt these things. Scripture has been fulfilled through John and is being fulfilled through me in a new way. A new way that pours new wine into new wineskins. A way that rejoices because you went out in the wilderness to see him and he didn't do any rejoicing or anything. And you said he had a demon. And here my disciples are rejoicing and you want to condemn them, especially for me healing on the Sabbath. But the time of rejoicing has come. Matthew chapter 11 verse 7 as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go in the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? Okay, we don't need to have uh, a degree to figure this out again. All we need is childlike faith. When the wind blows, the reeds sway back and forth. A firm tree doesn't sway as much. Maybe the leaves do on the tree, but the tree doesn't necessarily. But the reed sways in the wind, does it not? That's not what John was. He didn't sway. He knew exactly what his message was and he preached it exactly because he was filled from the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Verse 8 of Matthew chapter 11. Otherwise, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fly, fine clothes? No, you went to go out and see a prophet in the wilderness who ate locusts and honey, who wore camel's wool skin clothes. You went out to see a man Look, those who wear fine clothing are found in king's palaces. Where was John at that time? In the king's dungeon. Huh. That makes sense when we look at it that way. That's how the prophets were treated, right? What did you go to see then? Because many of these crowds had flocked to, to see John and to be baptized in a baptizing of repentance because John knew that someone greater was come that would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Yes, you went to see a prophet, I tell you, and more than a prophet. Verse 10, this is the one about whom it is written, prophesied about. Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. My messenger ahead of who? The Messiah. Where we read it, the verses from Malachi this morning. Verse 11, Truly I tell you, that means, hello, if you have ears, listen up. Hello, listen, listen, verily, verily, I tell you, I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has risen no greater than John the Baptist. Let me tell you who John is, because Jesus is standing up for him because he's in, imprisoned, and he will soon die. John the Baptist was the one prophesied about who would prophesy about the one who is to come, me. Look at Jesus' next words, though. Yet even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Wait a minute. Now that doesn't make much sense, does it? 
If John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets, that means that puts him over Jacob, Israel. That puts him over Moses. That puts him over Abraham. That puts him over Elijah. Wow. And whoever's the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. That person saved by faith only who doesn't even have a chance to do great deeds in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because the new wine has come. This is the new kingdom, the new covenant. So repent and believe because now you have seen fulfilled the coming of the one. And some of them would live on, not John, to see Jesus die for their sins and be raised again. John had to die before that time if Jesus was going to talk to him about that, talk about him this way. His mission was through. He had to decrease so that Jesus could increase. And what other way than to tell his disciples, Jesus is the one, now I'm ready to die. And we don't see any other parts of the, the story other than John dies next. And we're like, how, how, how could that be? Well, I don't know again. I don't know the Lord's ways. From the days of John the Baptist, verse 12, until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subject to violence, and, violent lay, and the violent lay claim on it. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. These words are different in Matthew. That's why I'm reading Matthew. The very next words, verse 14. And if you are willing to accept it, are you? Then you'll realize that he is the Elijah who was to come. So if you accept that, you know that he pointed and prophesied about me. There is no doubt. So there's why that question is there. What is the question? Are you the one or should we look to someone else? Well, now I've got to take that question again and say, well, I know I shouldn't look to Buddha or Confucius or anything else, but what do I look at? What do other gods do I have other than Jesus Christ being Lord of all in my life? Do I look at my health? Do I look at my grandkids in the wrong way? Do I look at the things that I have and the freedoms I have in this country? Do I trust in those things? Do I have idols that I don't think I do because we don't make graven images? Is Jesus Christ the one? Or am I looking for, for something else in this world? Because if Jesus Christ is the one, I'll live differently, won't I? Verse 15, who, He who has ears, let him hear. You know that profoundly is spoken to the churches after Jesus departs from this world and writes those loving letters back to his churches. Now John's question has been out there and the crowds here, his disciples here, Jesus' disciples here, the Pharisees here, the world hears that Jesus is the Messiah. Will you believe and will you hear and obey? Oh, those words from Isaiah sound a little bit more understandable now. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about it. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness the, for the, uh, the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Yeah, we don't see the day of God's vengeance coming here because Jesus is offering peace. And that's exactly what these words go back to John in prison and give him peace. That what Jesus answered him was, you know those words from Isaiah, they talked about me and they talked about you. Be at peace. Your, your job here is done. Now you get to go to glory. So back to Luke chapter 6. We skipped through that portion because we covered it from Matthew. But Luke chapter 6 verse 29. Or we're not Luke 6 first. Even the people who heard this, even tax collectors like Matthew, turned. For they had received the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and experts of the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. 
So now the people are thinking, the disciples of John especially, what did we get baptized for? Oh yeah, I might have lost my way in two years' time. If I've lost my way this much and I'm this far off the path in two years, where am I going to be down in the future? What is God's purpose for you? Ephesians 2.10, you're saved by grace through faith, right? You get to verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Jesus tells us simply to believe because if you believe, the rest will follow. You will have peace that surpasses all understanding. You will have joy. You will see the fruits in your life because there won't be other things you're looking for. You'll know that Jesus is the one. Remember Matthew wrote in Matthew eleven fifteen, 15, He who has ears, let him hear. The next words of Matthew are, To what can I compare this generation? We're right to Luke's words word for word. They are like little children sitting in the marketplace calling out to others. We play the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking. He lived that religious life that you want to see and you say he had a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking and you say instead, look at this glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. No way he can be the one. But Scripture clearly talks about John and clearly talks about me. And you went and saw John as a prophet pointing to me. Do you believe? No. Let me tell you what this generation is like. You're like spoiled brats. How's that? Just because I didn't do this or that, you, don't, you want your way, you don't see me as the one. And that's your excuse why you won't live. No, your excuse why you won't live is you have other loves and other affections in your heart other than the God who loved you enough that He gave His one and only Son to save your life. What do you truly believe? Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of His miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Let me remind you of Jesus' word. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. And then the words that end this section in Matthew. But wisdom is vindicated by her actions. Luke's version is a little different, by her children. Why do you think that is? Do they say the same thing? Because if you're a child of God, your actions will prove who you are. Are you a tree that bears good fruit? Have you truly repented? Is Jesus Christ the one? And mothers especially since it's Mother's Day, do your children see that in your lives? Don't forget, we've got a little special gift for you, the flowers and the little gifts. Grandmothers and mothers. Mothers, because we had a little special little grandmother's gift that I had also, so we stuck them in there. You are blessed. You have everything that God has given you to be a godly woman in this world. Whether you have children or not, because you are still a light to others that come in your path. And a godly woman is a blessing in homes. And before sin ever came into this world, God made it known to man that it was not good to be without a spouse. And he gave the ability to have children, that they are a blessing and heritage. This was good. Not only was it good, but it was very good. And you can still live that type of life even in a sinful, fallen world. So let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for mothers. We thank you for who you have given us, because your word tells us to honor our fathers and mothers, to weigh them heavy. Whether or not they're the perfect mother or anything else, you have given us the mother that you have to make us into the men and the women that you have called us to be. I pray a special blessing today upon all the mothers here. Lord, I thank you for my mother. I pray for healing as she's just went through knee surgery, Lord, and I thank you for her giving up part of 
her income and her time to raise me godly, Lord. Send me to a Christian school. It was a desire of hers. And I thank you for putting that in her heart. Lord, help us to honor our mothers greatly, no matter, like I said, the mother they appeared to be to us or not. But to know that this is the woman that you gave us to be our mother, and every one of us here wouldn't be here without a mother. We thank you for the blessing of marriage and the ability to have children, that blessing that you give. And I just pray a special blessed day for all the mothers that are here. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Daphne, this is your side, just so you know. I don't think you're a grandmother yet. I mean joy. I know you're not Daphne. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>